Michelle and I always tell our daughters, look, summer work is just a grind. You doing something that is useful to your employer, the person who is paying you, and it may not be fun. And that's okay, because that's what it means to be a grown-up. A president focuses on the forces that grow the country's GDP. But for the rest of us, we care less about the big number than the small number that drives it, our jobs. Do we have one? Do we like it? Are we secure in what we do? Do we feel pride? In his new Netflix series, Working, What We Do All Day, former President Barack Obama explores the concerns and hopes of workers across the spectrum. I sat down with him to talk about the show, plus his own views on finding purpose at work, how he views artificial intelligence, and what his best career advice is. This is President Obama on Working. Well, Mr. President, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Uh, the new documentary is terrific. As the former president, you could focus the world's attention on anything. Yeah. What made you decide to focus on work and the meaning of work? Well, I, I think we're going through a, a pretty long stretch of disruption when it comes to work. And, uh, you know, you have a global financial crisis when I come into office and, and a, a deep recession that lasts for a long time. You have a pandemic that completely disrupts people's work. You've had decades now of successive waves of automation uh, and globalization that have made people feel more insecure in their work and, and you've seen greater stratification in, in the economy than you've seen in a very long time. And so I think there, we're, we're at the cusp of even more questions being raised. Uh, as a consequence of new technologies like artificial intelligence. And what that means is we're probably gonna have to rethink how work is organized, how our economy is organized in, in some pretty profound ways. And I thought that uh, to be able to revisit what work actually means to people on a day-to-day -day basis, how they think about it, um, what kind of work is considered good work versus bad work, Focusing on the human element of it uh, would be a useful part of that conversation, which so often ends up being this 40,000 foot real dry macroeconomic, microeconomic discussion. Because um, this is how we spend our lives. It is. But when you were president, you must have spent your days on the macro. We did. But the micro is how we live our lives. And I yes. think having these cameras turn on to the commute and what you do during the day and the lunch. There's so much of the documentary is about people eating. And you realize like that's a lot of work is getting the snack and sitting down with people. So you could have focused on the bigger picture, that micro. What, what do you want people to get out of seeing these, these kind of micro images? Well, as you know, I was inspired by a book that uh, a, a well-known Chicago uh, reporter and uh, radio personality and raconteur named uh, Studs Terkel had written called Working. And, and I was struck when I read this book, which was essentially just a collection of 100 interviews of people from every walk of life, shoeshine you know, men and, and uh, uh, guys in CEO suites and lawyers and garbage uh, collectors. And what was so powerful about the book was it gave you a sense that, that people take pride in being useful and that a lot of work is really hard that we take for granted, mm -hmm. as we learned during the pandemic when suddenly we declared people as essential workers. Well, they had been essential before the pandemic, we just didn't see them. My hope is, is that by uh, us giving a window into people's lives, that the, the housekeeper at a hotel, you know, the person who's delivering your food, uh, the, the, the person who's taking care of your elderly relative, that informs then some of these broader policy debates. How should we think about wages and benefits? You know, how can we organize uh, our, our society so that uh, if you're working full time, you can support a family? How should we think about uh, structuring our education system so that people have a better opportunity uh, to have jobs that uh, not only make a contribution, but are also interesting and, and make people feel some sense of control of, uh, over what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Creating that kind of sense of connection, that empathy for people who sometimes may be invisible to us, I think is a useful way for us to then at least frame 
some of the broader economic debates that we end up having. Out of the stories come the policy? Yeah. The pandemic changed how we saw essential workers. It also changed what people wanted out of their jobs. A recent LinkedIn survey found that 71% of Americans search for jobs where their values are aligned with the companies. Two thirds said it is a deal breaker if the values don't align. This desire is especially strong among the younger generation. In the documentary, you mentioned that this search for meaning is a relatively new thing, and it, it kind of worries you. You think about your daughter's generation, and right. you worry about the next generation. What is it about the need to find meaning in work that makes you a little bit nervous about where we're going? Part of it, Michelle and I always tell our daughters, look, some of work is just a grind. Some of the work is you doing something that is useful to your employer, the person who is paying you, and it may not be fun. <laughs> right. And that's okay, because that's what it means to be a grown-up. And I think that part of the, the motivation for wanting uh, recognition for work is spot on. Being fairly compensated for your work is spot on. And as you proceed in whatever occupation you're in, hopefully you have more and more control over how and what you do on your job. That's going to give you more satisfaction, more agency. Um, on the other hand, you know, part of what I think an earlier generation understood, and maybe we don't because we've become so both money obsessed and work obsessed and status obsessed, is that so much of what's important in life may not come through your work. Hopefully you will have wonderful people that you work with and, and gr make lasting friendships. <laughs> But a lot of your friends are going to be people you don't work with. Your family, the hours that you're home are going to be probably more meaningful for you over the long term, those intimate relationships you have. So what you want is a balance. Young people looking for work that they find interesting, that they can throw themselves into, but not thinking that that becomes a substitute for, for the other aspects of our lives you know, volunteering, family, uh, friendships, civic engagement, you know, that make for a well-rounded life. It's true, work is in everything, but most Americans do spend about 90,000 hours of their lives at work, and they want that time to be meaningful. Companies know it and are stepping up their game. On LinkedIn, employers are increasingly using value-related terms like DEI and work-life balance to attract talent. Another hot topic, AI, and what it means for jobs and job security. Do you think about what impact AI is going to have on this next generation or how people should think about preparing for work at a time when AI is about to upend a lot of what we do? What we saw in the 70s, 80s, 90s, on through today is automation profoundly transforming manufacturing uh, certain rudimentary uh, aspects of white collar work. When I got to the White House, somebody explained to me that there used to be an entire floor just dedicated to the secretarial pool. Because right? the White House churns out a lot of paper. And that's gone, right? Because computers and word processing wipe that out. But I don't think that we've seen what I think AI could do very quickly which is make obsolete or redundant big swaths of what we used to think of as higher order knowledge work. And, and I think that will be surprising because we've been telling people or telling ourselves for a while that the answer to automation and manufacturing is to retrain workers for this knowledge work. Right. Well, if it turns out now that an algorithm and, and these large language models are going to do the same thing in those sectors as was done in manufacturing, where does that, that leave us? To what degree does it be exacerbate what's already increasingly a winner-take-all economy where if you are at the very top of your profession, you can capture the entire market through uh, an internet connection? Well, AI. If you've got, you're really good, and you've got now AI assisting you to magnify 
uh, your services, um, you know, you, you, you can get bigger and bigger market share. All those things I think are gonna be profoundly disruptive. And what that means probably is that a lot of the questions we've already had about the portability of benefits, how do we treat temporary work, uh, you know, how do we treat remote work? How do we think about um, the distribution of income? Uh, you know, how do we think about uh, public goods like the social safety net? All that stuff is going to have to be re-examined, not just by employers or employees, but by society as a whole. And right now, we're not yet ready for that conversation, but it's coming at us, I think, faster than anybody we expects. We have to be ready for it. We're going to need to start having these conversations fairly quickly. Uh, I'll, just a very concrete example, there's been talk for a while about 40-hour work week versus a 35-hour work week to spread more work around. You know, that, that's a conversation you haven't seen in the United States, but at some point you may need to start having those conversations, particularly in connection to, with what's already happening in in fits and starts as a result of the pandemic, which is people having more flex time. Having a coherent uh, policy around those issues, I think, uh, and, and a, a serious discussion about them is long overdue. The White House recently sounded the alarm about a lack of urgency around artificial intelligence and its impact on jobs, because the impact isn't obvious yet. But here's what seems inescapable. AI won't be like tech upheavals we've seen in the past. This time, it's knowledge workers who are going to see the biggest disruption. Jobs will disappear, but new ones will also be born. A LinkedIn survey found younger workers have the most interest in learning AI-related skills. But what President Obama says, the key to building a career, no matter what changes, is to be someone who gets things done. What do you tell people when they come to you asking what they should do for their career? And did working on the documentary change how you think about career advice? Most important uh, advice I, I give to, to young people, A, uh, just learn how to get stuff done. Hmm. And what, what I mean by that is, I, I've seen at every level, people who are very good at describing problems, people who are very sophisticated in explaining why something went wrong or, uh, why something can't get fixed. But what I'm always looking for is, no matter how small the problem or how big it is, somebody who says, let me take care of that. If you project an attitude of whatever it is that's needed, I can handle it and I can do it, whoever's running that organization will notice, I promise. Uh, and, and which is why I think with young people, you don't always need to be so impatient asking for the plum assignment, a lot of times the best way to get attention is whatever is assigned to you, you are just nailing, right. you're, you're killing it. Because people will notice, oh, that, that's somebody who can get something done. And the second piece of advice that I, I give is uh, worry more about what you want to do rather than what you want to be. I think so often um, people have in their mind, I want to be congressman by 30, I want to make X amount of money by this age. And the people I find that are most successful are the people who say, man, I'm really interested in computers and figuring this stuff out. And then they end up being a Bill Gates, right? Or I'm really interested in, you know, uh, how to, you know, cure this disease. And they, Maybe they don't end up winning the Nobel Prize, but you know what? They have an extraordinary uh, career because they're just interested in the thing itself. If you are absorbed by what you're doing, one of two things is gonna happen. You're gonna get really good at it, and whether you're rewarded, recognized, you get the positions that you want or not, the journey will have been a good one. Mr. President, this is terrific. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it, Dan. Thank you so much. 